those of you um, who have seen me this morning for the keynote with Dr. Well, Roland Gesshausen, he's doing his PhD at the moment. Um, Roland will be um, presenting um, today's talk, and I'll um, be facilitating. My name is Caroline, and um, I'm a graduate of Monash University, and I just finished my Masters of Teaching. And we're going to talk about some of the pop-up spaces that we um, and we did um, over the past 12 months at Monash University Facu Faculty of Education. Okay, let me share with you the screen, Roland. I think Caroline's got an expertise in a Zoom here. Must be a master of Zoom. Hang on, Roland. You need to probably speak up just a sec. Just a tick. Okay, if you could speak up. Think Caroline see everyone is, there? Uh, Say hi. Zoom master of Zoom. Oh, hello. I can see everyone. Hello. All right. So, Roland. Quick, quick show of hands. Who can, see, who can hear me? Oh, yep. Yeah, I saw a few hands there. Thank you. So, Roland um, is um, video conferencing um, from Melbourne live because um, he's unable to make it due to where he's at the moment. Um, I'm surrounded by forest and yeah, because of bushfires. But no, he's he's safe. But yeah, just just need to be there protecting the fort with his family. Um, so pop up education maker spaces, Roland. And um, oh. I've introduced myself. And what what do you do, Roland? Um, I'm just Roland. Um, <laughs> notorious for these events. Um, been poking around. I'm an old fossil. Um, in the days we used to bang rocks together. Um, I guess I'm a lecturer at Monash University and I'm actually going to be teaching next year at Virtual School Victoria. Um, and I'll have a wonderful students like Caroline to teach across uh, Victoria. It's good to see them doing that now. They're, we're trying to reduce CO2 footprint by making good use of technology for uh, driving it forward. And we're one of the only schools, I believe, that's actually using Moodle as its core system at Virtual School Victoria. So big thumbs up for that. So what are we exploring today, Caroline? Um, what is the point of a makerspace? Makerspace, sorry. And what does a makerspace look like? And what is a pop-up makerspace? How do we connect play and tech? OK, we've got a few videos. We're going to dive in. So our challenge, actually through uh, Caroline and the students in the class, was I want you to design and host a pop-up makerspace for the public. And pop-up's temporary. It just could last for a couple of minutes. Um, maybe an hour, or in uh, one case, it ran for two days at uh, some schools. So there was a challenge for the students um, because most of them tended to have a training background, and this wasn't an environment that was conducive to that. And we tended to be led by the gadgets, weren't we, Caroline? Yep. Next. So, what do we need for a makerspace, Caroline? Well, um, we need an authentic problem to solve, to solve, something to learn, hard fun, room and permission to make mistakes, uh, somebody to learn with, and a final pitch to sell our idea. All right, a nice infographic on the side there. And that's, most of you would probably already have an idea about what it is, but the term hard fun might be new to you, and I will unpack that more. And I'm hoping you to look at this, not just as a lens as uh, maker is or tinker is, but look at it with the lens of being a pre-service teacher or maybe a teacher who hasn't actually explored anything beyond just talking. The talking and reading off slideshows isn't teaching, is it, Caroline? Let's have a look at the next slide. So we've got here a picture of a maker space. It's a portable at a primary school. This is. Uh, Noble Park Primary School. It's uh, an area of Melbourne. 80% uh, of the students don't speak English at home. A huge uh, international uh, cohort. And the kind of things we're looking for is to, a way of blending entertainment, creativity, media skills, communication, engineering. And we do it in a way that actually encourages self-directed learning. And for some teachers, it can make it very uncomfortable thinking, well, how do we actually go about um, uh, measuring this performance, uh, gauging it, or um, or stimulating it. Well, we're lucky. We've got a couple of tools to do that with. Next. Now, do you want to explain this one, Caroline? 
Um, well, in the Australian curriculum, um, some of you who are, have the education background will know, there's th uh, three main ways of thinking that we want to impart um, in the digital technology um, curriculum, and that's uh, the computational thinking, and uh, there's systems thinking, and this one here we're talking about is design thinking. So you want to um, go through that, Roland? Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of different things we might do. There's no one way to actually um, run a design thinking class. This is only just one model. It's called the Stanford D model from the D or the design school. Um, but by helping break this up, makes it a little easier for teachers to see. Um, quite often we get caught up with the um, brainstorming, but the empathize of the new part at the front end there, it actually puts people front and center in the design process. And lastly, um, you may have a test, but that could also be a pitch where we may have a prototype and we're simply just simply learning how to put forward our idea or, or sell it. And we take it quite seriously sometimes and when we do it in a more formal way by recording a video of someone selling their story. Now, this is a little bit hard to read sometimes. So the next slide I find a little bit easier. It's my cheat sheet. So what we do of empathize, we're searching for rich stories and to find some love. I like the notion. We've got here the definition, users plus the need plus the insight at the point of view and defining it. Ideating, yes, 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 yes. And prototyping, building to learn, not just to last. And showing instead of telling and getting their hands on, this is how it could be used. So even a broken model could be a way of actually pitching an idea. Next. So how do we regulate behavior, Caroline? So you've got to consider your audience and you've got to plan for safety. So it's not only safety um, for yourself, of course, but safety for each other. Uh, make sure that there's um, enough uh, signs and checklists, like the previous um, speaker was talking about, the uses, usage of equipment. Um, but first and foremost, you do need to do a risk analysis. Um, and what do you mean by that, uh, Roland, the risk ana analysis? What really what I'm talking about there is that um, we don't just hand out um, box cutters to the primary school kids so they can do some creative carving. Um, that could end up with all sorts of dangers. So we do actually think about what can go wrong and anticipate that and plan for that. Um, but it doesn't mean that we become completely risk adverse and the only tool that we're going to give students to use is a staple. Um, it's surprising. You don't have to have box cutters. There are a wonderful uh, company called Make Do that actually makes these plastic kits that you can Google make do. You can actually then see some of the kits that they do. They allow you to use cardboard by punching it through, connecting the sheets and building huge mega constructions or cubby houses with uh, waste cardboard. They even come up with a special cardboard sword that can barely cut a carrot, but it does allow you to actually give the students a way of actually cutting up cardboard. So in a nutshell, yeah. yeah. Go on. You're rather lucky in Queensland. There's a really cool makerspace. I think it's QUT. Um, it's a public makerspace that people can go there and use. And what they do for the safety is they use QR codes and the equipment with your ID tag and you swipe in after you've done an online training course to gain access to particular machines. But in a nutshell, we're running a space that's innovation infused. So this is a video. Um, uh, yeah, this. This video is um, last year's class, Roland. Um, yep. Pre-service teachers showing various gadgets to the general and public that walk through university, other students, so forth, yep. Yeah, and, and you'll see some of the planning that actually goes in advance, the makerspace. Now, they're still very gadget-led where the technology is leading to the fore, and you can see how we slowly change some of this. Um, 
because it's been really interesting. Uh, there's a lot of um, really good technology that I can incorporate in the um, learning environment. And what did you like the best? Um, I like the um, little bits. I found them the most interesting because um, I feel like there's a lot of creative freedom that, that students can use with them and um, you can make a lot of cool things with them. I liked the Makey Makey as well. Um, I felt like it was an achievable thing to actually put into the classroom and it was affordable. Thank you. Alright, that's very good. And you made that one as well. <laughs> so, what are you using to like Tinkercad or Yeah, we're making it. It's called a bus around the I like that you can use everything. So when you come in here, you can build, you can play. It's great. Yeah. Thank you. There's so many things to, to look at. More, I've never seen a lot of this stuff here. Yeah. There's um the second video, Roland. What's this video about? Now, we repeated this in the Central Australia on an uh, expedition called uh, Day of STEM. Um, it's of a team. So these are with Indigenous students and uh, urban students in the Northern Territory. Oh, missed that. Try that again. Hmm. Maybe that link's not... video's not working. OK, that's right. We can skip that then. Um, if you go to the Make It in Malaysia. Now, we did it again in uh, Malaysia. This was at Semio Rexam. It's worth Googling Semio Rexam. We are actually a partner for this organisation in a way that we can be feel proud about. It's a Southeast Asian Ministry of Education organisation, and Rexam is the regional centre for science and maths. It's based in Penang. What's interesting about it is that um, we have a stake in this. Uh, Australia, Australia was the one that actually paid for, nominated um, Vietnam to become a member for it, and we paid for it. And that was part of our apology for the Vietnam War. Indonesia paid for and have supported the nomination for East Timor, and it was part of their apology over the back past. It's a message I think that sometimes gets missed that um, there are some really good things that are happening in Southeast Asia to build bridges. Now we went there as a group to help them with their STEM education policy and to develop the plan. You can see there some of the electronics we're doing, just the next page. Most had never programmed before. Well, I noticed my typo on the spelling there. Yeah, thank you. Um, building a prototype. Now we built a metal detector just using circuits and bits they have metal traps which were hurting elephants in Thailand, and so we're developing a metal detector for that. Interesting. And in this one here, um, they had a group of ladies, um, I think that was from uh, Myanmar, and they were helping actually with building a gate system for sustainably harvesting fish. And we're using the little bit of electronics. Um, they're expensive and probably over way of a price compared to what you do with regular electronics. But they do allow you to prototype really fast. And so once you've built your circuit, you can photograph it, then go away and buy the bits and pieces and actually have a go at coding it. Now, here's just listen to some of the discussion here. How did you work as a group? We built upon each other's strengths. We have an expert in maths. Coming together, collaborate. Our background is maths. And the teacher's gesturing at the graph here. And something interesting happened because even though we'd set them a particular challenge, they ran off on a tangent and they began to follow their own exploration. This is a maths teacher in the bottom diagram here. He's never coded before, but he was fascinated in the properties of magnets and actually started to discover something that he hadn't heard of before and used it as a gateway to understanding science. 
And this is what's been really interesting. You don't end up actually ending up on the trajectory of the journey that you may plan for because it is being led by the students. Now, have a go at this one here. You'll see the bionic hand here that they actually made. It was one of the challenges to make a big bionic hand. Where the, let the students think what happens if they have no hands or if uh, Find out, feel the bones and color which part of the bone that they can feel from their friend. This I feel. You are you did not make uh, make use of the straw, right? And the second one is this and the third. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's a problem solving in real life scenario. What we are doing now. Lesson one. We will discuss about the function and then after that, we have a group discussion. We pick the good and the, uh, the, the fail one to a group and they will, they will know, they will use their ideas how to improve the hand that they got. <laughs> Peter, you, you want to use this? So for the pandemism, so this is the... Template to make a reflection from the check that this level is identified. Are there kita perlu sambung? So do we need to feel uh uh below the terminity to be Images, the spirit of school. Yes. 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 Process is very important yep. because uh, normally people are eager to get to the product and then try to solve and get the tangible product, but they don't see that the, the process, the design, yeah. the brainstorming, the design. Just noticed I'm wearing the same shirt. Okay, that was yeah. interesting. And this particular project here was setting up a makerspace in Federation Square, but it's a virtual makerspace. And it's not just about the physical technologies. Um, we had the kids, and this is really quite mind pop. It's like Google and Google. Um, if you're looking into that map, you're in Federation Square, looking at a virtual Federation Square, which is based on Minecraft. And the children are actually greening that by putting in beehives, flower gardens, um, orchards, and green walls on buildings. And then they're looking over their shoulder at a reimagined city that they've made virtually, which then changes the perception of the city that they're living in. And for some of the um, indigenous groups that were based at this um, activity, you begin to look at some of the world, what it might've been like before the city was there. And that was uh, a food festival that we did with the pre-service teachers um, at Federation Square. Now, hopefully we're doing that again. 
So some of the tinkering that we're doing at Monash. Do you want to play this video? Yeah, it's just, just a few minutes. I think um, the link Not doesn't playing. work. That video rolling? Not playing, okay. I'll move on. Now, could you explain the Lost in Space? Because that was your project, Caroline, with the team. Yes, yeah, so um, in my cohort, the Lost in Space is a challenging um, maker space that we set up for um, two schools, one a boys' school and another a girls' school. And they, the school wanted a collaboration program, so um, we set up a two-day challenge um, and we used the concept concept of lost in space and the reason why it's lost this is uh it's the it's the abbreviation of the two two schools am i allowed i'm not am i allowed to mention the, the name of the school loretto and st kevin's yeah so um loretto girls and st kevin's um boys yeah so that's why lost in space and um we used uh different um digital technology uh gadgets such as uh, micro bits and um uh, Spiros, which I was in charge for, and the Rube Goldberg machine. And um, I think uh, one of the other ones, um, you, you were doing the, um, the AR, yeah, Roland? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it was, yeah, a wonderful collaborative program. Um, and yeah, it was hands on. Um, yeah, the main thing was we set it as an engaging context. Um, so the kids, we set up the kids, they were lost in space and um, lots of icebreakers and um, we set it as a challenge like when they would move to rotate to a different gadget, like say the Spiros, um, they would work collaboratively and gain a ticket to the final puzzle. Um, yeah. Caroline, um, just move on to the next slide. That's where we kind of finished up there. And you could see a picture of the students. Could you explain some of the activities there? Yep. So um, the top picture here on your right, that's um, Ari running the Rube Goldberg machine. So it's just, a, we just used um, different like bits like Lego and um, wooden blocks and so forth and marbles. And they were just challenged to basically run one end to the other, right, Roland, for that mm -hmm. one? Yep. And um, the second one is Billion running the uh, micro... Is that the micro bits? Yep. And that's, that's, that's me running the Spiros um, with the kids here. They're just um, learning how to code for the first time. Some of them haven't had exposure, so uh, they were learning block coding using the Spiros. And that's just through the maze. And it's all like inquiry based. So I did give them like some teacher led instructions, but they were sort of experimenting themselves. And, um, you know, in normal part of coding, you'd need to, um, it's trial and error. And um, yeah, each time they would just, um, you know, have to alter and debug as you would when you write an, a program. Um, and yeah, that's just the final photo where we all, they all connected the puzzle to join, yeah, to get their big picture. So remember, for some of these students, you, I, I had pre-service teachers who had a good grounding in C, and Java, uh, script, and I know with Python, but for these kids, they hadn't actually done much coding at all. So we had to be really gentle and fun about it and then keep it engaging. And that context is really important. We use space as a theme. They were surviving, had to work together as a team and being able to put all those pieces of the puzzle together to survive. So, about curiosity, interest, and engagement. I mean, improving student participation by just chucking stuff is just gonna waste time and money. It's like trying to teach French without actually speaking it. We need to connect it with the real world. And it means we need to allow some experimentation. It means there's got to be room for them to make mistakes. And what's really good with um, software, it's kind of cool. You can actually see the change in the behavior from those mistakes. Um, we don't really allow hands-on testing in biology classes and chemistry classes for obvious reasons. Um, so we're in a really good place for being able to empower kids over something, giving them some control, motivation, and also to have some spontaneous collaboration 
or um, some different interactions in the classroom that you might not normally get. Did you notice that happening, Caroline? Yep, encourage, um, yeah, social interaction, yeah, for sure, yep. So, <laughs> yeah. Next. So, again, that's Noble Park, and that's the final boat that they actually made. It's a solar-powered boat with um, bilge pumps and motors and foam, and they actually entered that into one of the uh, Science Works competitions. So it's an area you can explore, build, create, and importantly, the students can learn without actually facing the front of the classroom or receiving explicit steps or pieces of knowledge from the teacher. They direct the action. And that's a big change for the way that we teach the pre-service teachers, where often when we script an activity of a lesson plan, we kill a lot of the creativity and innovation that happens in these spaces. Hard fun. I'm going to move quickly over this. The shavian reversal is something to watch out for in this space. It's worth writing that down if you're curious what it means. I'm not going to unpack it too much. I don't have the time for it. But it means that you can sometimes, just by putting education and fun, that you get the worst of both outcomes. I'll explain. Next slide. Seymour Papert unpacked it. You get the traits of the offspring that are the worst and you lose all the good traits. And it's a problem when you just simply say, this must be fun because it's a computer. Why can't it work? You have to be really deeply pedagogical and critical in the way that you integrate education and entertainment and edutainment. Something Seymour Papert warned about us years ago. Now, he also told us about something called hard fun. Next. There's a chap who's got his keyboard at the window trying to control the real world. It's one of those silly memes that's out there. But hard fun is actually really important. It's something that Seymour Papert came up. It's when you have something that's hard, it's transformative, but there's enough freedom, creativity, laughter, and joking and playfulness to actually keep it engaging. It's hard because it's difficult and fun because I've got the freedom and creativity. What tends to kill this stuff off is when you add a high stake to it. And that's what happens when you include high stakes testing and it kills a lot of the fun out of when kids want to do coding and programming. Um, it's one of the dangers of actually having a regime which is driven by some sort of high stake like um, your VCE exam or university assignment. And that's not the real game. The real game is about connecting it in the challenging in the real world. Next slide. So this is a chap, he had a challenge and this one was, he made a periodic table in Minecraft with his students, which he's printed out. And he didn't know he could be doing it, but kind of whacked it together. Um, it had never been done before. And that was an, a work of art, but also something that you could actually give to a blind student that was able to read. And that was one of the challenges that he threw the class. Now, you can imagine you, what you would feel like when you've been inspired to make something like that. Next slide. And that's actually my PhD. I can't give you the full details, but I can tell you that I'm interested in that Eureka effect. When all of a sudden you have some incomprehensible problem or some intractable problem, and you're able to jump in and work it through. And I know now the conditions for what to happen. There's some sort of effort, there's preparation, but you have to have an open-minded attitude, some small accomplishments that actually make you feel like you're succeeding 80% of the time, and some inspiring managers or teachers for ROM, my pre-service teachers, to how to set up the conditions which actually allow you to inspire kids. Now, we used this slide this morning. Do you want to explain about it, Caroline? Yeah, so maker culture is um, technology-based extension of do-it-yourself culture, um, and it intersects with hacker culture. Did you create this uh, model, Roland? This one down here in the bottom, Roland? Yep. Did... I reckon I want to redo my diagram now. I'm <laughs> you did create it. <laughs> yeah. So um, okay. it reveals the uh, creating of new devices. Uh, revels in creating new devices and tinking with existing ones. So I guess what you're saying is um, you really just got to get out there and um, get the kids hands on, yeah. right? Rather than just talk and yeah, just get it hands on and give them a challenging problem in an interesting context. And that's when learning happens. Yeah. 
we have to hang on to the technology. Some people begin to wonder that STEM is just about science and maths, but the tech plays an absolutely pivotal part. And things like Linux makes it really affordable to have an operating system on a chip that you can put inside your machine or your invention that allows it to listen, act, think, behave, move. And I think that intersection is really powerful. Um, I'm feeling a lot braver now about using the word hacker, about getting in and understanding something and then reconstructing it and imagining it. So I'm, whereas before in the past, we tended to sort of look with some scorn on the use of that term. I'm bringing it back into the fray. Okay. So just wrapping up, Roland, we've got to wrap up now. Lessons for open education. Um, so what you've written here is challenge and explore, build questions, um, questioning, yep, connect and create, create by make room in the curriculum. So, um, yes, yeah, so you've got to try with all the theory in the curriculum, you've got to um, make way for hands-on activities um, and, yeah, pop-up maker spaces whenever op uh, you've got the opportunity. Um, and, yeah, do you want to continue, finalise it? Is there one or two questions that people might have? Yep. Next. Any other questions? Thank you. So, um, do you have any questions for Roland? He ran a lot of these pop-up maker spaces last year, and um, you know, at the end of the day, the cat, it's a way to educate the public is to get them to touch and feel, and then ask questions through that. Yep. Okay. Well, I think that's it. Thank you very much for listening.